So I'm going to start with this sculpture from ancient Greece, actually out in the Aegean Sea. And um, I'm going to do a share screen on. Share screen. Yeah. So this sculpture uh, had an influence on modern sculptures, which we'll talk about. That's why I'm showing it. And it's also beautiful in its own right. So it's good to know about. One. All right, let me try that again. Okay. Cycladic, cycladic civilization about 3500 BC at the Aegean. In southeastern Europe, at the center of the Aegean Sea lies a group of islands called the Cyclades. They got this name during the archaic period of ancient Greece. Cyclades is derived from the Greek word kyklos or cycle in English as they form a circle around the sacred island of Delos, the place where the gods Apollo and Artemis were born. It was on this group of islands that in the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age period the Cycladic civilization was born. The first traces of human activity in the region date to the 8th millennium BC. Sharp tools and weapons made of obsidian, a black volcanic rock, were found in mainland Greece, the Aegean Islands and Asia Minor. The obsidian that was discovered originated from the island of Milos. It seems that people visited the island to extract the volcanic glass, although the island itself was not inhabited as no permanent settlements of that period have been found. The first permanent settlement in the Cyclades was founded in Saliagos, a tiny island between Paris and Antipyrus. During the Neolithic period, the sea level was at least 6 meters lower in the Aegean, so Saliagos was probably connected to both Paris and Antipyrus. The settlement dates back to 5000 BC and was a center for the processing and distribution of obsidian. The houses were made of stone and a wall was built around the settlement. This is where the oldest marble figurine of the Aegean was found. It is known today as the Fat Lady of Saliagos, and it's missing its head and left shoulder. After Saliagos, many other islands were inhabited as well, such as Andros, Naxos, Paris and Antipyrus, to name a few. The people that arrived and established settlements of these islands were probably both from mainland Greece and Asia Minor. What we know today as the Cycladic Civilization began around 3200 BC during the beginning of the Bronze Age. It is divided into three periods. The first period starts from 3200 BC and ends around 2800 BC. By 3200 BC all the islands of the Cyclades were inhabited. The findings of this period are scarce compared to the two following ones. There are traces of both fishing and agricultural small villages. There is no indication that the society of the period was hierarchical and there is hardly any evidence of walls, meaning that the settlements were quite simple. It seems that there were trade relations between the inhabitants of the Cyclades and the ones living on nearby shores. During that period we see the rise of marble crafting. Lamps, bowls and figurines were carved out of marble in a sophisticated way. The marbled human figurines would become the symbol of the Cycladic civilization and their most famous works of art. The figurines were found both in houses and in graves. They were rather small in size at the time. 
The most prominent type of this period is a so-called violin-shaped figurine, which has abstract human characteristics, although gradually the figurines would become more and more human-like at the end of that period. Archaeologists have studied how these figurines were crafted. The islanders would cut a piece of marble, which they would later scrub with a pumice stone to make the surface smoother. Then, they would carve and cut the marble with obsidian tools or other sharp instruments to give their figurines their final shape. Around 3500 BC, as the Neolithic period was ending, metals were introduced to the islands and the Cycladians would slowly start to be involved in metalworking, mainly copper at that time. The second Cycladic period began around 2800 BC and ended in 2300 BC. This period is considered to be the peak of the Cycladic civilization. The islanders slowly abandoned their villages and started gathering in larger settlements. These small towns were sometimes built on the shoreline to control the trade routes or were built further inland upon hills for protection from the strong winds and to supervise farming lands. Some of them were surrounded by walls while others were not. The islanders expanded their trade network and enhanced it. By that time, they had become experts in metalwork and crafted many bronze tools and weapons which they traded with the Greek mainland, Crete, the northeastern Aegean islands and Asia Minor. Nearly all of the bronze weapons found in Crete dating from this period were made in the Cyclades. They also produced bronze tools for themselves, advancing their agriculture, sailing and artwork. Along with the metalwork, they also exported pottery and minerals. With the larger settlements and the introduction of job specialization, we see the forming of a social hierarchy as it is natural in such a state of a culture. This becomes more evident through the findings of tombs, which were more elaborate than others, suggesting that the buried individual had a high position in his society. During the second period, there was also a great rise in artifacts, the most famous of which was the new type of marble figurine that dominated the marble crafting repertoire of the time. It depicts a human figure, most of the time female, with its arms crossed. Thousands of these were found all over the Cyclades. Their size varied from 15 centimeters to 1.5 meters. Just like the other figurines, they were found in houses and graves. As researchers discovered, most of these figurines were painted, but their colors had wore off by the time they were excavated. After that, uh, um, <clears throat> when this became, you know, <clears throat> published and artists began to see these around the turn of the century, I think early 1900s, and the desire to get back to a more uh, pre-European or pre, pre um, um, so like the original uh, impetus for art, more sacred art, uh, get away from the European Western tradition, which had been exhausted and uh, in the sculpture that the realistic sculpture that it produced. And so, you know, they looked at Africa uh, and other um, places in Europe where <clears throat> um, <clears throat> earliest civilizations were being excavated and their art and pottery um, was being discovered oh. and had found influence. Yes. Excuse me, Joan, I'm having a hard time following your words. You are, okay. I, I'm sorry, a little louder perhaps? Okay, how about now? Can you hear me? Better, much better, thank you. Uh, the point, yes. I was, point I was making is that these uh, sculptors had an impact on modern artists, modern sculptors, who were looking for a more uh, ancient uh, source of art. They finished carving the figurine. The islanders would usually paint the details of the face, such as the hair, the eyes, and the mouth. Some of them also had markings on their face or their body. The colors varied, but the most prominent were red and blue. Another very interesting find of the period is a specific type of clay vase known today as frying pan. These clay vases got this name because they resemble frying pans but were not used as such as no trace of fire has been found. What is interesting about these clay artifacts is the drawings and shapes carved on them. Some depict ships and boats while others depict the sun or the stars. 
There are many theories about their use. Some archaeologists suggest that they were mirrors because if you fill one side of the clay vase with water, it reflects a clear image thanks to the material of the object. Others say that they were probably vessels for jewelry, while there are some who suggest that they were instruments for the navigation of the sea. The most important discovery of this period was made on the island of Kerus. There, archaeologists Colin Renfrew and Croesus Dumas found thousands of broken marble figurines and vessels. What is interesting is that none of these broken objects matched one another. After some research, they found many of their missing parts on different islands in the Cyclades. This suggests that these objects were deliberately broken on other islands and then parts of them were brought in the island of Kerus. Nearby the area where they found the broken figurines and objects is an island called Daskalio. Since the sea level was lower in those times, this island was actually connected to Kerus. There, they excavated a great settlement which seems to be the largest of its time in the Cyclades. The houses which were made out of marble were connected through narrow roads and walls were built around the town. A stairway entrance was built right in front of the settlement. The construction of the settlement required good organising and hard work. Transferring large quantities of marble from other islands and building this settlement was an enormous feat, as in those days the boats were relatively small and without sails. It seems that Keris was of great importance for the Cycladic culture, and as archaeologists suggest, the settlement was primarily a religious centre among many other things. This would explain the mystery of the broken figurines and vessels which were shattered and brought to the settlement. I stop there. Let's give you a, let's give you a basic general introduction. I'll pick it up with other um, specific figures, figurines. Towards the end of the 19th century, archaeologists discovered hundreds of stone tombs on a chain of islands off the coast of Greece. Although many were empty, some contained skeletal remains surrounded by objects. Among them, figurines, predominantly female, carved from pure marble. They were initially dismissed as ugly, and thought to be the naive creations of a primitive culture. As it turns out, they were the remnants of a civilization that was both more ancient and more sophisticated than had been imagined. Hi, it's Congressman Jeremy Raskin. Forgive me for being so direct, but it's important. Yeah. Will you rush $22 right now to help me? Between Greece and Turkey lies the expanse of the Aegean Sea which is home to a cluster of islands known today as the Cyclades. Roughly 30 of its main islands are inhabited today, some of which have been continuously inhabited by humans for well over 5,000 years now. The climate here is dry and mild, with strong winds that blow in mostly during the summer months. Though they share similarities with one another, each island has its own unique characteristics. Take Milos, for instance, which sits on a massive volcanic arc that was produced by a collision of tectonic plates starting at around 5 million years ago. Its distinctive landscapes and unique geological features are evidence of its volcanic origins.
Milos attracted the interest of Stone Age visitors as early as 13,000 BC, thanks to its rich deposits of obsidian, a black volcanic glass created by the rapid cooling of lava. This raw material was fashioned into tools and weapons with razor-sharp edges. One might say that the elegant obsidian blades are the first distinctly man-made form to emerge from the islands, a most useful kind of sculpture that changed the way of life for the earliest known explorers of the Cyclades. After the discovery of obsidian on Milos, a span of roughly 8,000 years passes until the first settlements begin to emerge on the islands. Northeast of Milos, nestled between the island of Peros and Antiperos, is a tiny landmass called Saliagos. A very important find, in fact the earliest known Cycladic figurine, was discovered here in the 1960s by archaeologists John Davies Evans and Colin Renfrew. At just over two inches tall, she's affectionately referred to as the Fat Lady of Saliagos, and dates to roughly 5000 BC providing evidence for the earliest known settlement in the Cyclades. Here's a more complete figurine, dating from roughly the same period. Compare this form to the more simplified, abstract design of the figure on the right, known as a violin figure, which was also among the finds at Saliagos. A rather mysterious gap of some 2,000 years passes, until the tradition of stone sculpture reappears in the Cyclades at 3,300 BC. This new phase of sculpture is marked by experimentation. The figures are often shown standing, some with exceedingly long necks. Their faces often contain carved details, perhaps with the help of obsidian tools. At the end of the phase, details begin to disappear, Violin figures are also produced during this time, similar to their distant ancestors at Saliagos. A variety of silhouettes proliferates over the course of 600 years until the islanders seem to land upon a final form. At 2700 BC, Cycladic culture enters its mature phase, symbolized by the powerful canonical figure, also known as the folded arm figurine. They're called canonical figures because of the strict formula that would be used over the next 400 years. This phase is characterized by a sense of unity, precision, and confidence. With only a few exceptions, their slightly upturned faces lack any carved detail except for the nose. They're almost always depicted female, arms folded across the belly, right arm resting beneath the left. The gender is often indicated with a triangle. The legs are no longer separately carved. Instead, a line is used to separate them, making them less prone to breakage. The feet point down, extending the elegant line of the body. The backside also features in size details, and the figure's profiles are strikingly slim. The sizes of the figures vary. Most are modest and under 12 inches. Some reach twice that size. The largest ever discovered is just under five feet tall, making it one of the first monumental sculptures to be produced in the world. Many figures during this period contain traces of pigment that indicated details such as the eyes, mouth, or hair. Some also show tattoo-like markings across the face and body. Swollen bellies on certain figurines seem to indicate pregnancy, fertility, and new life. Were these figurines connected to religious rites or certain celebrations? Do they represent deities or everyday people? Why were hundreds of figures deliberately broken and their fragments deposited together on the island of Keros? And why do the vast majority of the pieces not fit together? In addition to the figurines, rounded forms known as frying pans were also discovered. 
Some contain symbols of the sun, along with female genitalia, which supports the theory of a religion in which the sun was associated with the woman's power to give life. This one shows a ship navigating the open sea. The ship has a long prow with a fish symbol mounted on top. Oars or paddles are visible, and the waves are depicted geometrically with a series of interlocking concentric circles. The temperament of the sea changes swiftly, and knowing how to properly navigate it was crucial to the development of cycladic culture. A recent theory suggests they were used as astronomical calendars based on the motion of the Sun, the Moon, and especially the planet Venus. It's thought that the days were tracked by making marks in the terracotta, which would allow them to predict a woman's pregnancy and pattern their lives in harmony with the cosmos. When it comes to cycladic culture, there are certainly more questions than answers. But it's often what lies just beyond our grasp that holds the greatest fascination and produces in us that impulse to imagine and to explore. In this We're in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, and we're looking at a small sculpture of a man seated on a chair, playing a harp. But what makes this a remarkable object is that it's probably about 5,000 years old. There are only about 10 of these that have been discovered in the Cycladic Islands in the South Aegean. Mostly what we found are tall, thin, highly abstracted female figures, and these have mostly been found in graves. And they were produced over hundreds and hundreds of years of various sizes. We don't know a lot about these sculptures, and the reason for that is that perhaps only 10% of these figures have been recovered by modern archaeologists in controlled conditions. The vast majority of these sculptures, male and female, have come to light on the art market. That is, somebody has gone in and unearthed them in order to sell them. The result is that we have no scientific archaeological records of where they were found, at what level they were found, so the chronology, etc is almost impossible. Right, we don't know what they were found with, we don't know anything about the context of the find, and in fact we'll never know because that knowledge is just permanently lost. So not only do we have a problem with the archaeological record, but we also have a problem because these are so popular in the early 20th century. They were discovered by modern artists and therefore we think many of them may have been created as forgeries. So the art market we think is awash with authentic objects that have been unearthed illegally as well as forgeries. That is is objects that have been produced in the modern world in order to look as if they were ancient. And when we look at these objects, we can see why the modern artists fell in love with these. There's a kind of simplicity. We know that Brancusi responded to these. We know that Modigliani responded to these. We know that Picasso loved these objects. They're highly abstract, and they look that way to us in a way that is not really true to what they originally looked like. We know that areas of the sculptures were painted with very bright colors, and so this pristine white marble abstract form that we so appreciate in the modern era is not what the people of Crete were producing. And look at the differences between the male and female figures. The male figures are rounded, the furniture is rounded, it's tubular. The figure's head is back as if perhaps he's singing, but of course we don't know. There is a little projection from that harp which we think may be the head of a bird, perhaps a swan. Again, we really don't know. Whereas the female figures are more frontal, more planar, and they are inside in a way that accentuates the geometry of their bodies. Not only are the female figures abstract, but they're also very compact. The limbs are folded in, there's no space between the arms and the torso, there's no space between the legs, the knees are just slightly bent, there's no real sense of movement. It is a closed composition that emphasizes the overall contour of the figures. Look at the shield-like shape of the face and the way that the nose projects. They're beautiful without eyes, but there were painted eyes. There was a painted mouth. 
We initially see these as flat, but when we spend a moment looking at them, we see that the head is at one angle, the neck at another, then we have the more complicated surface of the torso, and then it seems as if the thighs project outward and the shins inward again, and then of course we have the reverse with the feet. And so there is this almost slight accordion-like folding of the body. With later Greek sculptures, we might think about quarry figures from the 7th century, much later and on the Greek mainland. There we see male figures nude and female figures clothed. And here these female figures are all nude. That has led some art historians and archaeologists to speculate that maybe these are somehow related to Neolithic fertility goddesses. But the key word here is speculate because we have no written records. All we have is the object itself. They have been stripped of all of their original cultural meaning. And in some ways, that is also a very modernist idea, that we can appreciate the aesthetics, the object itself, unencumbered by what their real meaning was. There's a, um, in Athens, a museum of psychotic art. Next time you're in Athens, make a point of going. It says marble carving is most characteristics of this culture. And the abstract forms of its figurines have influenced several 20th and 21st century artists, such as Brancusi, who we're going to look at, by Bigliani, Giacometti, who we looked at last time, Barbara Hepworth, who we looked at last time, Henry Moore, who we're going to look at today, and Chinese artist Al Wai Wai, who we discussed uh, a couple of years ago, at least. So there's just. So these um, highly abstracted other um, human figures in marble, although they were painted, um, for me it gets it something like um, the essence of it's like has nothing to do with any one personality. Whereas European sculpture was about an individual or or, or a mythical figure like. Um, one of the gods or goddesses, or or a real person in great details, but their unique personality or their um, their clothes, etc., their status. But this is this is more universal, and I think this is what they were getting at. And at something about the human that's permanent, uh, stone or marble, and maybe for me, this I think they're like trying to get at the soul essence, you know, and. Uh, God speaks, it's, um, you know, evolution starts at the stone, but actually at the gas form, but then the stone, you know, so like the soul first gets trapped from the, um, in that most dense, most limited form. Um, and then, and also um, that the human form is latent and all, and, and, and that new book that's coming out and Marcia uh, um, Deuce's book, uh, how the human, she explains how, Baba explains that the human form is latent in, in all the pre-human forms, starting with stone, vegetable, um, worm, mineral, worm, et cetera. That, uh, trees are like the head is upside down. So the, so the human form is, it's a stone, but it's human form is there. And it, it's almost, the soul is there, even in the human form. Or also, or, and it's, it's what propels the evolution. So it's, it's, I think there, there's something sacred about it uh, for me in that it's um, these artists were trying to protect, portray, I think, what was eternal about the human and not just the individual personality. And that was kind of characteristic of uh, the artists um, in native culture, anyway. Okay. And that's what became a motivating force in, Turn of the century, the modern art. In a way, from uh, you know, art that was just for uh, the wealthy, the aristocrats, um, <clears throat> and become decadent. Someone's calling. I have a feeling it could be Sue Hold on one second. Hold on.
That was an error. Okay, sorry. Sometimes Mary Sue has trouble getting on unless she's unless she's already on. I don't know it. Okay. Having a 5G phone that's not on T-Mobile makes as much sense as mountain biking. This piece is very rare because it's one of the largest examples that exists and that's certainly the largest figure that I have seen myself and, and handled. Cycladic sculptures are very mysterious marble figures made in the Cyclades Islands in Greece. They appeared uh, at the beginning of the third millennium BC. These sculptures are enigmatic because we don't know for sure what they were made for. They were found in tombs, but they were also found on the ground. We don't know how they were made because tools were never found. This particular figure dates from the Speedus period. The main characteristic is this very special and specific lyre shape for the head, the rounded of the shoulders. They get much more angular in later periods. And then the fact that the legs had a little separation in the middle. That's when the sculptors were becoming more and more adventurous and trying to show off actually their skills. The ancient sculptor from the Cycladic Islands would use a set of proportions, a set of rules. So the head would need to be the same size um, as the upper body, and which would be the same size as the upper legs, and the same size again as the lower legs. They'd represent uh, both male and females, but more frequently females. As this example, the, the figure is holding her belly. There is probably a link with maternity. Something that is always surprising to think about for ancient classical uh, sculptures made of marble is that they were painted. The artists, I call them artists, maybe they were considering themselves artisans, um, wanted to create a lifelike image. Eyes would be painted, sometimes the hair, sometimes the pigment have been absorbed by the stone, and that's why we call them ghost paint. And so you can guess the curl of the hair. We see them now as being very simple, but 4,600 years ago, to achieve something like this is a, just a mastery. Uh, show one more, and then I'll move on to Henry Moore. So, yes. uh, is, uh, are you open to questions or, or, or do you want to just move along? No, no, go ahead. Well, like the things we're viewing, they're all like kind of pretty much kindred in that they're all human, pretty much we see a man, we see the, the violin shape we've seen a chair we haven't seen animals or indications of other than just the human form right do you, yeah. like are we looking at a, an isolation or a, of the time of work that was done and things that we found that have been found, discovered going back these thousands of years? Or what is there more, but that's not the, that what we're looking at is just featuring, focusing on these, uh, the representation of uh, the uh, human form. Because it's all predominantly human. And yeah, uh, yeah that they, 
I weren't representing animals, they were found in tombs. And um, yeah, um, that's what I get from this, this um, collection. The marble is hard and a bit brittle, is that right? Well, it's, it's yeah, hard. difficult medium, no? Or not, yes. Not brittle. Uh, well, at a certain point, uh, uh, it's like a stone. It takes, um, yeah. It's unforgiving. You gotta, once you cut into it a certain way, that's it. <laughs> you gotta live with that. So it takes it go, go the wrong way on you. Yeah. You gotta it's, have control, good control. Great deal, Probably so. a lot of abrasive um, work. Yeah. So. Um, and very light chip. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Again, this forms like this had a profound impact on modern artists. Uh, this will be the last one I show, and you'll see. Um, and it's funny that they're looking, they're, they, I think I like them better, and I think the artists, modern artists, did unpaint it. Um, paint it kind of gives it a more temporal quality. Yeah. Not, we have a now here's here's the two modern artists. They're saying this is Modigliani on the left, Henry Moore, who who I'm looking at. So wow. yeah, you can see the influence. So these these had a profound influence on uh, on painting. Henry, yeah. And so they were more American or European. Both. Well, no, well these are uh, European. Henry, Henry Moore uh, and Barbara Hepworth. These are all European sculptures, yeah. Ah. Oh. Okay. So, all right. So I just wanted to give you that background because we've been looking at Barbara Hepworth, uh, Giacometti, and his, uh, and like the, um, the ancient influence, the ancient uh, behind her work. It's good enough. So we'll switch now to Henry Moore, who is one of the great British sculptors, one of the great sculptors of the 20th century. We'll start with, with the art. He lived from 1898, uh, died in 1980, 1898, 1986. Uh, he was from Northern England, Castleford, up in Yorkshire. Near, I, I lived near there for a long time, uh, up, in, up in Yorkshire. Uh, and uh, switch over to with the art and back there. Uh, his forms are usually abstractions of the human figure, typically typically depicting mother and child reclining figures. Um, they're usually suggestive of the female body, um, except for in the 50s when he did sculpted family groups. His forms are generally pierced or contain hollow spaces. Many interpreters liken the undulating form of his reclining figures to the landscape and hills of the Yorkshire countryside. And, um, and you know, after the war, he became probably along with Rodin. Well, Rodin was passed by then. Probably, probably the most um, successful, most well-known uh, sculptor. Of the modern era. Let's go back to Wiki and look through some of his work. And if you want to make any comments as we go, feel free to. Um, there's, uh, you know, fairly suggestive in some ways of the human form, are limbs, head, uh, a lot of empty space, circular empty spaces, flowing empty spaces. Uh, uh, he did it, he worked in bronze, but the final cast was bronze. Three points coming together. That's cool. Yeah. What There's, is that, bronze? Yeah, it's all bronze. It's all, bronze. It's all these soft, 
you know, soft, gentle, wave-like forms, and then these sharp points all moving to the sharp points. So there's a contrast of uh, kind of uh, aggressive and gentle here. This is one of the family groups, late 40s. Helmet. Hind figure. <clears throat> What do you think of that? What do you think that is? This one right here? No, the previous one. Refining figure. That's interesting too. Who is, is this all one artist we're looking at? We're looking at Henry Moore. Henry wow, Moore. this far out, this guy's here. What are you seeing there? What do you see? Yeah. Well, maybe giving birth. To, but not much form to what's being issued, if that's what it is. All right, so looks like a female form, breasts, head, pelvis area, one leg, could be arms here, shoulders, but it's all rearranging the human form into a flow pattern, breaking it down, yeah. breaking it down, reassembling it. Come ahead and shoulder. Mother and child. <laughs> Ralphie, I don't know. Real life, real life, you things. Three motives against wall, number two. The past. Why do you think you call this the past? Why did they call it the what? Why do you think he titled this the past? P A S T? Yeah. Down here at the bottom left, the past. 1961. Oh, no. All right. Well, it's like the say, well, figures. Um, you say it's looking backward. Let's turn. Uh, maybe in a position where she's reflecting. Yes, she is in a state of yeah. somewhat it, repose, but. Yeah, this awkward is, for real repose, leaning against one on, on one arm. And the head's looking down, downward. It's usually when people look downward, they're remembering the past. Just when people look up, they're looking into the future often. So this downward, downward gaze kind of suggests a, a memory, being, a memory coming into mind. Three pieces reclining figure. The head's kind of little. Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, there's a distortion. No, that, that, that one, that one. That's it. Yeah, there's a distortion. It's definitely smaller than, uh, than ordinarily would be with the body that size. So Looks like E.T., the movie, that character from E.T. Yeah. I, I distorted that. Uh, Aaron, I'm thinking that it's a woman. She's less intelligent. Less intelligent. Well, yeah, smaller brain. <laughs> All right. Do so you want to go there? Well, you know, you don't see that many uh, Greek philosophers, women. I mean, I've never heard of when they always quote Aristotle, Socrates. I have never heard of women, a woman. Working model for nice eggs. There were some. Purely abstract. 
<laughs> were, you, were you there, Ralph? <laughs> no arches, right? But I'm here. <laughs> Jesus, Joe. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I think the person watches football, Henry. Well, Bill Arches. The pile? Yeah, wow. Is that a ball, you reckon? It's a round object. <laughs> you got a seated figure. Wow. So you supply the meaning. You supply whatever association. Yeah. Um, so what is it? What is this material, Joe? What is that one? Bronze. It's all bronze. Bronze. Oh. Right. Or stone. This is marble, but it's either bronze or marble. Wow. I kind of like that. What's the model for nuclear energy? Wow. Gotcha. The form is vertebrae. And then a bunch of uh, can go on and say, okay, this is all with the art. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I like painting, sculpture, entering into uh, abstracted. I'm breaking away from tradition. We set out to establish these Henry Moore galleries because it seems shocking that there was no permanent display of the work of Britain's greatest sculptor in the capital. The first smaller room looks at the relationship between Henry Moore and the Tate, one of the key artist relationships the gallery had. This second room then focuses on Moore as a public figure and it brings together a small number of his key post-war sculptures and most notably uh, the work behind me, the plaster for his reclining figure that was in the centre of the Festival of Britain in 1951. The 1951 reclining figure was part of Henry Moore's great gift to the Tate. It's the original plaster for a bronze that was commissioned by the Arts Council to go at the centre of the South Bank site of the Festival of Britain, a key moment in post-war Britain, a celebration of Britain's recovery after the war. Um, actually, the sculpture caused some consternation at the time because for many, this hollowed out skeletal figure, a quality that's even more noticeable in the plaster version, seemed to speak of, of suffering and, and, and emaciation rather than, than something more celebratory and affirmative. If you look closely at the surface of this sculpture, you'll see the surface is decorated with pieces of string glued onto the plaster, showing the volume of the figure using these sort of continuous curving lines to suggest the curvature of the body. And they probably derive from Henry Moore's drawings during the 1940s. Uh, he secured his reputation with his famous uh, drawings of people sheltering in the underground, and he's done that again here using these pieces of string. Before the reclining figure, one of Henry Moore's key post-war sculptures with his family group. And again, they came out of his shelter drawings. That he had focused repeatedly on the motif of the mother and child or the parents and a child in the underground. And in the post-war period, the family became a very powerful metaphor for the new society that was being established. And Moore very much became the artist of the post-war Britain that was being established with the welfare state and the National Health Service. And the family was repeatedly used as an image of a communitarian society. 
All of Moore's post-war sculptures were made um, at his house and studio in Perry Green in Hertfordshire. Um, but the, the earlier pieces, like the family groups, were made at a time when his existence there was much simpler, as much uh, smaller. Uh, there are lovely letters from Moore to friends in 1940 saying, we're renting this house Hoglands, we may stay here a little while. Um, and of course the house and the houses around it um, became part of Moore's world and are still uh, part of the Henry Moore Foundation. We're here in Henry Moore's maquette studio where he took inspiration for almost all of his sculptures. And if you look around you, you see all the bones and stones and flints and seashells that inspired him, as well as spare parts for figures, like in this cupboard. Um, you can see there's a bowl of little heads, and he could start a maquette and change the head. These already have little pencil markings for eyes. No matter how abstract the sculptures are, the origin was always a natural form. Moore worked on a really small scale, and the sculptures are small enough that he could hold in his hand. He could turn, he could imagine them any size. Uh, but only about one in ten were actually made uh, into bronzes. We know the big pieces in public spaces, but they all started off very, very small. Sometimes the vision was big, even on a small scale, you know, and he did say that monumentality doesn't have to do with scale. It's the vision behind the work. One of the things we wanted to draw out in these two Henry Moore galleries was the artist's process. We tried to get to the essence of Moore through these fairly simple displays, conscious that there are many of his works on public display elsewhere in London, and also just outside London at the Henry Moore Foundation in Perry Green, in the landscape that he loved and to some extent shaped, and also in the context of the studios in which they were developed. I want to show you something. It's not a side. He was from Hasselford, Northern England. <clears throat> yeah, so he was from Cas. This is Leeds, we're in Northern England. Castleford is here, and see this down here, Elkley. And there's, I lived there for about eight years in the next village, Addingham, right here. I used to work in Leeds. So I know this area really well. It's beautiful, beautiful countryside. <clears throat> Harrogate, you know, all things great and small, that doctor, the, the, um, the vet, that TV series where he was based in Harrogate, it's right here, <clears throat> close by. <clears throat> so fond memories. Sorry, I meant to show you. I forget this one. Describing something can seem very straightforward, but in fact, describing a work of art can take time and should take time because the more you describe something, the more you understand what you see and the closer you'll get to interpreting what you see. So this is why describing is one of those first skills that art historians learn. And really anybody who goes to the museum should have conversations about what they see and the associations that it brings to mind in addition to pure description. 
So here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to talk about when the sculpture was made. We're not going to talk about the historical context. We're not going to talk about the artist's biography. We're only going to describe what we see. I see a human body, and it's large, one that's abstracted, that's not a careful rendering of human anatomy. I see what look like arms and legs and a reclining figure. There's no question that we immediately recognize the legs, the knees, the torso, the elbows, the neck. But the more that we look at those individual parts of the body, the more that we see the choices that the artist has made, the more we recognize that this is not an actual elbow. That's not really a neck. That's not really a head. But we still see it that way. And most obviously, what makes this not really a body is the giant cavity, that giant open space where we expect to see a torso. But before we begin to describe the individual elements of the sculpture, I think it's also important to make a few observations about the material and the surface. The sculpture is a dirty white, and it's so smooth that it invites us to touch it, even though the museum would rather we didn't. Well, it does have these lovely curvilinear forms that feel like they would be very pleasurable to touch, but there's also a way in which that dirty ivory color feels like bone, feels organic. And that's complicated because bones are on the inside, but what we're seeing is the outside. Or is this a fossil? Has the flesh been removed? Except that the figure seems animated. It seems as if it's still intact. As we look closer, we see forms that seem to be missing. Hands, or at least fingers, feet and parts of the body also seem to be duplicated. What read to me as breasts occur in two places in the sculpture. What read to me as hips occurs in two places in the sculpture. So we can't be too literal at any point. You said a moment ago that there are no fingers, but there's a reference to fingers. That is, the fingers have been abstracted. If you look at the figure's left hand, it seems to be a fist with its fingers curled in, described by an oval of string that's embedded in the surface. Nevertheless, the artist has decided not to give us individual fingers. He's decided not to give us an ankle and a foot with toes and an arch in it. But that is still a foot because of the angle at which the leg ends. I get the sense of a heel, of toes, and I get the sense of where the ankle would be. It's as if the artist is inviting me to fill in what he's left out. In a way, the negative space, the space between the forms, feels just as substantial as the forms themselves. That space where the torso should be, which is empty. The way that what reads as the spine or the upper back is uplifted as the form seems to support itself on its elbows. That lovely negative space that gives us a sense of, of lifting up of the upper body. And because of that lifting up, not only on the elbows and the forearms, but also on these other indeterminate limbs, I get the sense that this is not only human. It's a different kind of creature, almost an insect that could move forward on all fours or perhaps all sixes. There's also a tension between the soft, organic, rounded forms and these straight lines that seem to draw our attention to a breast, an elbow, a shoulder. A contour. This is drawing on form. Granted, when I look at this sculpture, I can't help but think of the human body. But I also have a sense that I'm looking at a landscape, that the knees are distant mountains, that somehow this is a unity of human form and the earth itself. It's so funny that you say that because when I see this sculpture, I immediately imagine a figure on a beach. So I didn't just imagine a reclining figure. I imagined the natural location of this figure outside. Sun-baked. In fact, lifting up to catch the rays of the sun. The almost cushion-like form in the center of the sculpture that can be read simultaneously as a chest, as breasts, perhaps as a torso, as an indeterminate form, creates for me a feeling it is the feeling that I have when I arch my back. When I look at this sculpture, I feel that pulling in my body. And so the artist has used the simplest of tools. He's used form itself. He's used the line that he's constructed with string. 
and he's able to create in me an association and a physical memory. Some views of the sculpture feel very recumbent and languorous, where others have a sense of tension. If we look at what reads as the head, we see two circular forms with an indentation in the center that read as an eye, and that open mouth that seems to be yearning and even almost crying. So we've spent only a few minutes looking at the sculpture, but we've developed a whole set of associations. We've matched words with what we're seeing, and those words have created the foundation for our own personal interpretation. And I find that if I spend time describing, if I spend time looking closely, even a work of art that at first seemed difficult and confusing, that perhaps I didn't like at first glance, this changes, and an appreciation for what the artist achieved begins to develop. I think that was a good general lesson and I don't approach modern art, contemporary art, it's uh, more challenging. And any, any thoughts on that or any thoughts on what you see in this sculpture? Anyone? What, what was the question? What are you asking? Any thoughts on what you see in this sculpture? Now that we look at it in a little more detail, a little longer. Well, about is there a breast on the other side, the underarm thing? There's, there's one under the arm. What about the other side? Uh, not, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Now, I, I did agree with that description. I could feel the lifting up, the arching of the back. Yeah, it's amazing. I can see someone at the beach. Uh, yeah. I go to the beach every day. I live walking distance to the beach. Also, seems like someone doing a yoga pose. What's that called? The salutation to the sun? Is that the pose? Yeah. Yeah. Salutation to the sun. Uh, yeah. It seems like a yoga pose. Um, there's a bit of a, a screen here. So there, there's like, um, it's hit, it hits me in a lot of different ways. It seems, like you said, languorous. Um, and just relaxing, and yet there's tension, or maybe a stiffening of the body, like something's like looking up and seeing something, a bomb dropping or something. They're on the beach, and it could go, but you could go a different ways with it. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't like that it doesn't have like a head. It's sort of like huh? a head would be there. I can relate, and it didn't even bother me not having the feet or the hands, but there's something that's a little creepy about the head. Okay. The feet, you know, this could almost like they're buried in sand or water, you know, uh, on the edge of the beach, and uh, the sand or the surface up to the ankles. That's one possibility. So, you, you know, like you said, you finish them. Um, so those are actually strings embedded in the work. That's what he said. That's what they wow. said. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, straight lines. Uh, so, you know, like um, uh, Cezanne's giving multiple perspectives. If you remember to his still lives, uh, the table is like every fruit should be falling off the table, but it's going this way and that way. And uh, here it is. Here's this um, one of the main characteristics of modern art is these multiple perspectives. We talked about that complexity. And uh, here it is in sculpture form. Uh, um, what, what was the title of this? Did he give it a title? Declining uh, figure. I think that's it. What's that? Declining oh. figure. Yeah. Wow, well, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, these, uh, they invite you to, to stay with it, walk around it. Uh, pre-associate, uh, see what images, see what uh, memories, associations, fantasies uh, for you. I do have a question. Were there many sculptors in England? I, you know, I, I just, it's hard for me to relate sculpturing bodies to England. You know, I just... I don't know if you were here last time, a month ago, we looked at Barbara Hepworth. Remember? Yeah, I saw that, yeah, yeah. Uh, and right now, um, Amish, Anish Kapoor in London, 
is probably the most famous British sculptor uh, working. Um, uh, there's time I could give you a little bit of him, uh, Amish before, but um, those are those are big names. And, and um, what else? Yeah, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, and, and there's others, but um, Amish Kapoor, and um, Yorkshire Sculptor Park. I used to teach in that. I used to teach in that area. I've been here. Yorkshire is often thought of as the cradle of contemporary sculpture. And that's because Henry Moore was born here, Barbara Hepworth was born here, and Kenneth Armitage. Henry Moore often used to think there was something special about the people of Yorkshire, which is contributed to this. Uh, looks very good. Uh, could Jim, could you mute your mic here? Cut, you're talking over the video. Thanks. Everybody, they can meet tonight. And just unmute it when you want to make the comment. You know, this, this great centre for sculpture. He talked about the coal mine industry. He talked about the manufacturing base. And there may well be something in that. But what is interesting for both Hepworth and Moore is the integration of industry with the landscape. You know, there's no sort of separation of the two. And I think that has actually contributed to these two great artists, and in particular Henry Moore. But also when you look at the sculptures, the sculptures are landscapes in themselves. And you can see the way he's pitted the surfaces. Some surfaces are very smooth, some are beautifully textured, but they reflect the landscape. They reflect the organic nature of where we are. And that's what the work is all about. And that's why this place is one of the best places in the world to actually see Henry Moore. He transformed the whole way we perceive sculpture in this country. He transformed the whole way we think about sculpture. He was the first international sculptor we had, and that had a major influence. This exhibition, Back to a Land, is very, very different to every other Henry Moore exhibition that's ever been put together. It works, the title works at so many different levels. I mean, it's Henry Moore coming back to Yorkshire the landscape which he loved and was brought up in and had the initial influence. It also works in so many different ways. You've got this formal setting, you've got the wild openness of the country park. But the biggest part of the exhibition is indoors. And indoors you will see the little maquettes, you'll see the drawings, you'll see Stonehenge. You'll see Moore's concern with the English landscape in general. You see Moore's concern with poetry about landscape and the way he, the way that influenced his work, the way the poetry actually resulted in drawings. So the combination of all these things coming together creates a refreshing new look at Henry Moore. The Yorkshire Sculpture Park has found a photograph of uh, a visit that I made with my father and my son. Uh, and I, I remember it vividly. Um, I, I, I remember it vividly because it seemed to me to be the, the start of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. My father said that actually of all the arts, sculpture was the hardest. And maybe he meant the hardest to appreciate, the hardest to, to make. Um, and he said about sculptural form, for instance, it's the vocabulary of mankind. Uh, it was a great privilege to be his daughter because it meant that uh, every day of my life I was exposed to what it is to see, uh, to see the world in a way through his eyes. And as a sculptor, he was most interested in three-dimensional form and the interpretation of three-dimensional form. So every day we were thinking about, or he was talking about, um, Things like spatial difference, uh, form and shape and shadow and light. And as a child, many of the games that we played, I mean, there were games that my uh, father produced a pair of bathroom scales and all my little guests had to stand on the scales and he would guess their weight. And he could guess their weight within, you know, two or three pounds. But what this really demonstrates is that he knew the, the weight 
the density of a piece of stone or a piece of wood, or uh, it, it demonstrates a, a sculptural relationship with the world. Some of the things in, in the room that I've curated, uh, for instance, there's an African mask, um, there's uh, an African bowl, um, there are other items which remind me or make me imagine him discussing them in terms of shape and form and realisation of shape and form. I think this exhibition manages to make connections between external sort of land uh, and internal land forces uh, in a really interesting way. It juxtaposes works on paper with the sculpture so that you start to discover things that possibly other exhibitions had not um, illuminated. Henry Moore in America. I took the liberty of washing your sex toy. By the way, this is very small. It could totally get lost up. Hi, I'm Richard LaCale, and I'm the art critic of Time Magazine. I'm here at the New York Botanical Garden to do a tour of Moore in America which is a very unusual show of work by the great British sculptor Henry Moore. Let's start with this piece right here. It's called Oval with Points, and it's a bronze from 1968 to 1970. Moore was fascinated by the forms of nature, and he incorporated them into his work. He was a great collector of stones, of bones, of natural formations, pieces of wood. This particular piece is actually based upon an elephant's skull, one of which Moore owned. He was fascinated by the forms of the skull, by the voids, the open spaces within it, and by the slightly sinister connotation of the two points reaching out towards one another. Nothing about this sculpture says it's a picture of a skull, but everything about it says that it's a form somehow taken from nature that has something mordant about it. Moore is an artist who's really best captured on video rather than, say, still photography, because each of the pieces gives itself up differently from every angle. He very much intended that sculpture should be a three-dimensional, 360-degree experience. Moore particularly admired the art of non-European cultures, things like African wood carving and pre-Columbian stone sculpture. One of his early inspirations were Mayan chak moons, statues of a reclining figure leaning on its elbows. He incorporated the memory of that form into the many reclining figures that he made all throughout his life. This is Knife Edge Two Piece from 1962 to 65, and it may look like two pieces of toast. It's actually based partly on geological formations. Moore grew up in the north of England, not far from the rugged hill country of Yorkshire. And as you begin to move around this piece, it presents itself as something like a ravine between two sheer cliffs. Although from certain angles it looks like a wall, for Moore, the space between the two main volumes, that long crevasse, was as important as the volumes themselves. As you circle the piece, that negative space is continually brought alive by the undulations of the bronze walls that form it. Moore was so fond of this piece that he had it placed within sight of his home, a place he called Hoglands in the Hertfordshire countryside outside of London. This is Hill Arches from 1973. And it's a good example of Moore's ability to make a form that suggests more than one thing, more than three things, more than five things. In some ways, this is a natural formation, a hill. And in other ways, it obviously suggests arches, architectural forms. In fact, it's almost a kind of a building that you can walk through in itself. And the New York Botanical Garden has wisely cited it in front of their Mertz Library with its arched windows that are so much like the archways that Moore was thinking about when he made this piece. But there's something anthropomorphic about these forms, too. Something about them that suggests people interacting, approaching one another, tumbling, embracing. There's something playful about it. This is draped reclining mother and baby from 1983. And it's one of the enduring motifs of Moore's career. Throughout his life, he continually returned to the theme of a mother and child. He had close relations with his own mother. He found his father a little bit distant. This piece is probably a good place to mention the ups and downs of Moore's reputation. In the years right after World War II, Moore was celebrated as something like the embodiment of the modern artist. 
Picasso may have been more famous, but I think it's fair to say Moore was more beloved. His work seemed to strike just the right balance between representation and abstraction, between the recognizable and the mysterious. He was especially popular in the U.S., where for years the fastest way for a city or a university campus to declare itself in tune with the modern age was to acquire a big, distinguished Henry Moore. But by the 1960s, there was a backlash among certain critics and also by a new generation of artists, pop artists, minimalists, who thought that a lot of Moore's work looked corny and obvious. Sometimes they had a point. Throughout his long life, he was 88 when he died in 1986, Moore had powerful ideas, but he also had a sentimental side. It was one of the reasons for his popularity in the first place, and it comes out in particular in some of his mother and child pairings. This is one of my favorite pieces in this show. It's called Two Piece Reclining Figure Points, and it's from 1969. And it demonstrates something that was basic to Moore's approach to sculpture throughout his career. In the mid-1930s, he started to divide his reclining figures into two pieces. And sometimes in later pieces, he divided them into three parts. He felt that this automatically rendered the figure more abstract, which it certainly did, even as it still held a memory of the human form. And I think it's, you can understand very well what he was getting at in a piece like this. This is a piece that suggests the swells and inlets of the human body. It brings to mind limbs, sometimes amputated limbs. Yet it's so abstract that at the same time it begins to suggest a geological formation, the way the Sphinx does. You can see that in some places Moore has polished the bronze, so that it's smooth and suggests skin. But in other places it's rough and striated, so that it resembles rock. But at the very, very top of this piece, Moore has also left a clear hint that this is a human figure. That's a face. It has three little dots in it, two for eyes and one for a mouth. It's the most basic abstraction of a human figure, but it brings the piece back down to earth. The Botanical Garden is not encouraging people to climb up on the sculptures, so don't expect to be able to do this if you come here. But I came up here to make a point about the enveloping form in the Moore sculpture. This one's called Three Piece Reclining Figure Draped from 1975. And it also uses a lot of Moore's themes and brings them all together. The division of the human form into three different forms, the use of negative space, like the one I'm standing in, as a part of the sculptural experience, the sculptural quality that suggests an anatomical form, and yet at the same time... Yeah, head, this head looks so much like that psychotic um, standing female. Let's go back a few seconds here. You must have seen that. Sculptural experience, the sculptural quality... I mean, that, I can remember what we were just looking at, this whole section of it. ...quality that suggests an anatomical form and yet at the same time has an abstract character. The amputated limbs, the likely that you see there, and the very simplified human face, like the one up above. Moore once called sculpture an art of the open air, and that was certainly true of his sculpture. This show at the New York Botanical Garden is a perfect way to experience it. All right, so yeah, no, after the war, 40s, 50s, into the 60s, it's probably the most um, <clears throat> well-known, most popular sculptor in the world. And then, you know, people move on as they do. Uh, but he's still, still uh, admired and respected. So the other one I wanna to cover today. Um, one question about his name. Yeah. M O O R E. I mean, did he just change it to stand out or what? Or are there are a lot of M O O R's. Uh, no idea. Yeah, because <laughs> usually when I've ever seen a name more, it's M O R E. Uh, right. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, it's interesting. Yeah, I just assume that was the thing, his family name. Yeah. His father was a. He was born in the mining district. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to switch over to Brancusi. Another one almost as famous and well known as um, Henry Moore.
And again, looking at the links back to that cycladic culture, he lived from, uh, he was from Romania, uh, Constantin Brancusi. He lived from 1876, 1957, uh, walked from Romania to Paris and ended up seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, he was a painter, photographer, sculptor, made his career in France, pioneer of modernism, one of the most influential sculptors of the 20th century. He's considered called the patriarch of modern sculpture. Uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, Brancusi sought inspiration in non-European cultures as a source of primitive exotism, as we talked about, Paul Gauguin, Picasso, Doreen, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Romanian folk art, uh, traceable through Byzantine and Dionysian traditions, which were Dionysian or leading to the, to the Greek traditions. Sleeping Muse. Kiss. We talked about this. I showed the Smart History video on this. Might show again, again, this time. But <laughs> yeah, you have arms, people, their arms are wrapped around each other. You get the suggestion of legs pressing against each other, two eyes, face, yep, <clears throat> done in this very squarish, rectangular block. <laughs> and, you know, very, very brings back thoughts about ancient Mayan or Toltec Mexican sculpture. <clears throat> <laughs> Mm. Then, boy, this, I mean, this face looks just like that one of the Cyclanian uh, Greek sculpture. Just has a net protruding nose. He's got a little bit more of a mouth. <clears throat> There's the kiss again. <laughs> Lips. One eye, the two eyes become one. Close up. <clears throat> it's like they merge, they're merging into each other. Becoming one, one eye. This is a lovely one. <clears throat> Madame Pogany, I've got a video on this. A uh, friend of his sat for this. I can't hear. Someone said something. Uh, I was just saying the name. All right. Yeah. Mademoiselle Pogani. An arch. Oh. A guillotine. <laughs> it's his ex. All right. I wonder why he gave this to a feminine. <laughs> what is it? Princess X. Yeah, that's interesting. Princess. Sculpture for the blind, beginning of the world. Yes. Uh, you have your eyes closed and just running your hands over this egg, stone egg. Torso of a young man. Sleeping news again. Sleeping news. The first cry. Huh. <laughs> Madam LR, portrait of Madam LR. This is a famous one of his, Golden Bird. Just the essence of 
birdness coming out of the yeah. bowl form, you know, this uh, bird in flight, wings retracted, or bird soaring down towards the water. You guess them an eye there, I guess. Sorceress. Sorceress, wow. Yeah. Reminds me of Moore's uh, helmet. This is wood, I think. Yeah, wood. It's wood. This one was made from wood. Uh, Corso of a young girl. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very beautiful and uh, sweeping up. Yeah. Looking down. Um, Thinking, it's almost like a female version of the, the thinker. Of a what did you say? A female version of what? A female version of Rodin's The Thinker. That famous one where the, uh, the man is resting his chin on his fist. Oh, uh, The Thinker, yeah. yeah. This is like, it's quite, quite beautiful. Rodin's Thinker. Right, bird in space. The bird in space, yeah, I like that. I think ah. I think it's his birds better than his kiss, blockhead kiss. I don't know. Like uh, coxcomb. Wow. White negress. White. Fish. <laughs> Fish. Fish. He's using um, negative space again, like this characteristic now of modern sculptors. Negative I, thought, space. I thought it was breakfast is served. <laughs> <laughs> Two lanes. Wow. Signal. Ah, that's not going to those drawings. Very playful drawings. It's like, it's yeah, place. is that sense of humor? I like that sense of humor. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Uh, okay, the kiss is on blocks. Wow. The endless column. <laughs> we called that one the kiss, too, that last one. Yeah, I think that's how it was originally presented. I like that one better than that other one. The Gate of Kiss. Oh. The Gate of Kiss. Ah, feel. Ah, uh, oh. a, yeah, it definitely has the seal. The uh, it's definitely, you can see the seal. Uh, leaping out of water. Yeah. yeah. Wisdom. So, what did he call that last one? The the uh, female. What was it? Wisdom. There. Wisdom. Oh, I like it. Again, you know, uh, contemplating, sitting down, contemplating, innerness there, arms folded. Wow. Collect. Let's reduce the human figure to just a few, just a couple lines. So I'm, I'm just curious, these are they from his latter part of his life or what? That would be interesting to me. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what periods they were. I think because, I'm... you know, he was doing art a long time. Yep. All right, so let's look at some videos on him. <clears throat> Bird in space, art history. Hey, we might talk over the 
We're in the Museum of Modern Art, and we're looking at Constantin Brancusi's Bird in Space from 1928. Brancusi was a, was a Romanian who worked from almost his entire career in Paris, and he worked in lots of media and often pushed the materials to really new expressions. Is um, this bronze? It's, a, it's bronze that has been really highly polished. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it looks like gold. But it's not just bronze, because for Brancusi, the pedestal was part of the sculpture. Ah, and, and it's got a stone It's pedestal. got limestone um, below that. And very often you would actually see a wooden pedestal even below that, creating a kind of hierarchy of materials from the most, what he considered the most primitive mm -hmm. to the most So is there industrial. a kind of Neoplatonic idea of ascending from the material up to the immaterial? I think that that's exactly right. And in fact, the reflectivity of the bronze really drives that point yes. home because it, it is really about light and about actually about movement, yes, right? Yes, it is. This, is. this is not a sculpture that is any, in any way a literal depiction of a bird. It's a depiction really of this gentle, organic arcing of this soaring figure. It's not a bird. It's so much as a representation of, of the thing that birds do that we love. As one sort of moves in, around it and looks at it, the light that reflects on it shifts and changes and flickers. It does. So it does have a sense of, of something almost kinetic. Well, that's right, as if it were moving and soaring. But it's not a propulsion that seems mechanical, even no. though it is metal. And we see it almost as a kind of industrial material. There's a great story about this sculpture. And actually, it's this sculpture in particular. This was included in the famous 1936 exhibition at MoMA called Cubism and Abstract Art. Mm -hmm. And when this came over from France, the customs agents kept it and wouldn't let it out Why? because MoMA was claiming it as a work of art and they didn't believe it. This is 1936 and they thought it had some industrial use and therefore it could be taxed. And MoMA said, no, it's a work of art, it should not be taxed. And it was actually held and there was a little bit of a court case but about it. What purpose could this possibly there was, there serve? Was, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the paper suggests that it may be in some way a propeller or a piece of a propeller. Huh, interesting. Um, so, it really does speak to the radicality, which I think we forget, of Absolutely. just how abstract this is. Yeah, just to us, it, it, it doesn't really, in some ways, look so abstract. It does suggest flight and upward movement, and we're used to things suggesting things I think that like that. that. I forget, he uh, you know, had a deeply spiritual side. He had both sides. He could be very central, very spiritual. But he really liked Miller Repa, and who Baba said was a perfect master. And he thought of himself there for a while as the reincarnation of Miller Repa.
didn't like being labeled an abstract sculptor. Uh, he said what we call realism is, is false, and that the essence, the, the essence of uh, an object or person or, uh, is more real. And what we call abstract is actually more real. And what we call real is actually false. <clears throat> Brancusi is not only, I think, really the most important sculptor of the first half of the 20th century, but his influence in the second half has been extraordinary, often most strong in work that doesn't look anything like his work. There's a painting of mine. It's flat, of course, but I like to discover how he built up his shapes. He was a worker. He was a laborer. He did his own work, and that's something that I think has kept me fascinated by him, because I think that's where my own work is rooted. All I can say is if you want to know what I think about Brancusi, look at my sculpture. My sculpture, Mute, is more eloquent than anything I could say. I was taking blocks of stone and removing, in my own crude way, removing enough material to the point where I thought the piece became something other than what it was. And that, to a large extent, was based on my interest in Brancusi. I call this piece Wake because if you think there's about 260 ton here, this piece has a, a weightlessness and it has a kind of nautical fluidity to it, and the passages almost flow through like water. In terms of the work that I've been doing the last, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years, this is the most weightless piece I've ever made. Brancusi's endless columns really gave rise to the idea of a sculpture that could be built on a repeated unit. It opened the door to all sorts of sculptors and sculptures, which took this logic in countless directions. Art is a reference to other ideas, and he did it in the most simplistic way. When you look at a Brancusi, it's needs nothing else. I think it'll be very interesting to see how Brancusi continues to be received, transformed, reinvented by this next century of artists. I'm certain that that will continue to happen.
I'm standing in front of a platform full of sculptures by Constantin Brancusi, a Romanian-born artist who walked from Romania to Paris when he was a young artist. He made sculptures that explored the idea of abstraction. In the center is Mademoiselle Pogani. The bronze is dated 1913, and it's based on a marble and made from a plaster from 1912. It was actually a portrait of a friend of his, Margit Pogani, a young Hungarian woman. When the plaster was on view in 1913 in New York, it became one of the star pieces of the Armory Show, not in the sense of being most beloved, but being most ridiculed by the press and by the visitors. Together with Marcel Duchamp's nude descending the staircase, Mademoiselle Pogany was lampooned probably more than any other object there. What was the problem? It had a name. Brancusi was clearly telling the visitors that this was a portrait. This was not a head. It was an egg, is what they said. And Brancusi delineated the hair, not by any sculpted forms of curls. She was considered bald. The facial features, by the slightest of descriptive lines or incisions, were seen as nonsensical. We're at a point in history where Brancusi is beginning to abstract from a fairly naturalistic image into forms that were much more pure and simplified down to their really essential features. And this was something that today, I think 100 years later, we all look at and know that we're looking at a woman. At that time, it was almost incomprehensible that that would be how you could represent somebody's face. Brancusi is known today as the great patriarch of modern sculpture, this pioneer of modernism. And he was the fifth of seven children born to Romanian peasants in the Carpathian Mountains. But he spent most of his working career here in Paris, having pitched up in the city in the summer of 1904. Tell me about the series that this belongs to. In 1909, Brancusi created the first Maison Dormi in marble, which is now at the Hirshhorn in Washington, D.C. And from this marble, he cast a plaster, from which he then cast six bronzes. This is the sixth bronze that we know of from this series. Just prior to embarking on the Maison Dormi subject, he had treated the subject of sleep in two other works called The Repose and Sleep. They're both in marble and they're still very indebted to Rodin. He did work for a very brief time in Rodin's studio, but decided that it wasn't for him and he needed to fly on his own wings. And why was that? It was far too classical for him. He went through the Parisian museums, the Musée Guimet, he studied Asian art, he studied Egyptian art, Assyrian art, and he really broke with tradition and created his own modernist aesthetic. He was an incredible craftsman and artisan. He handled every one of his objects himself. He patented every single one of them including himself, this including this one. He did the gilding himself. He never actually gave an object to a founder to create the patna or the, to the finishing effect. Within each group, you can say that every object is unique because he did treat each one differently. I mean, there are these stories, aren't there, about him saying an artist needs to do his chores. I mean, he, didn't he say something like, uh, you know, create like a god, command like a king, work like a slave? Like a slave, yeah. It's great. Is there a sense that he realised that he was edging ever closer to abstraction? I don't think he strove for abstraction. It's a distillation of form and feeling and that inner state of being. I mean, one of the really distinctive things about this is the overall shape, this egg shape of the sculpture. That becomes such an important thing for Brancusi, doesn't it, in his sculpture in general? It is. It's, it becomes his signature form. These facial features that we have in the first version of the Maison Dormi just sort of melt away into this completely sleek form of that embryonic sort of egg shape. It's an extraordinary object that really communicates an incredible depth of serenity and thoughtfulness. 
What was his legacy, do you think, on the art that followed? Well, Brancusi is an artist. He really did liberate the subject matter from our preconceived notions of what it should look like. I think Brancusi was incredibly true to himself as an artist, and I think throughout his entire oeuvre, it's a quest for that inner truth. It's so fascinating to consider Sleeping Muse in the wider context of Brancusi's career, because by 1909-1910, he was reducing forms to their essentials. He was inching ever closer to abstraction as his works were becoming sparser and sparser. And as a result, he was imbuing his sculptures with something really magical, a sense of purity, serenity, a smooth vision, if you like, of the sublime. I agree. Uh, Sarasena, uh, an art young woman studying art history in New York and coming from another country and the sense of comfort she found from that. Um, I'm standing in front of a platform full of sculptures by Con. I don't want to go. Sorry. Where to go? The comment back this one. Whenever I think about Muma's collection, which is located on the unceded land of the Lenape people, this is the first gallery that comes to my mind. It's filled with seven sculptures by the Romanian artist Constantin Brancusi, or Brancus, as pronounced in Romanian. I hope I got that right. My name is Veronica Moana. I'm an intern in the Department of Media and Performance and a Fulbright student from Hungary. When the new expanded MoMA opened was right around the time I moved to New York to study art history. And I remember the chaos of those first weeks, just trying to keep my head above water and adjusting to the pace of life here. And I remember visiting the museum and um, coming to this gallery and just this sense of calm came over me. I don't know what it was, but probably the stillness of the sculptures and the sense of familiarity. And this one work in particular drew me in instantly, titled Mademoiselle Pogan. So here I am all alone in the museum, and the first work I see is a depiction of a Hungarian artist, Margit Pogan. She met Brancusi in 1910 in Paris, where she was studying painting, and um, she sat for him a number of times. According to her, Brancusi sculpted a bust in clay and then discarded it each time. And even though Pogan begged him to keep those, he just laughed and threw them away. And so he ended up actually creating a portrait from memory after Pogan left for Hungary. He first carved it in marble and then created a plaster mold and cast four different versions one of which we see here. To me, one of the most striking things about Mademoiselle Pogagne is its simplicity. But so much has been said about how controversial Brancusi's sculptures were at the time due to their abstraction and due to him challenging the French academic style. But less has been said about how African art has influenced this generation of artists who were white European and experimenting with abstraction at the time. And so the simplicity and the simple geometry of the face of Mademoiselle Pogagne has been likened to Cota Reliquary's uh, figures from Gabon, which function to protect and demarcate the bones of family members. And there's certainly a sense of spirituality in this sculpture. I like to think of it as if she was even meditating. She's also been compared to archaic Buddha statues for the large stylized eyes. And so there are all these influences from African art, Asian art, from Eastern Europe, of course, that somehow create a harmony in the sculpture. And I also love the gesture of the hands and how the head gently rests on them and how all these different elements add up to create this very simple, overloid, overall form of the figure. 
And so it was works like this in the early 20th century that gave my first entry into art history. And now they remind me of how much more there is to the history of modern art than the white male Eurocentric perspective from which it's often been told. And Mademoiselle Pogani was one of the first friendly faces in the museum for me at a very stressful time. And now in a different period of time with its own complications and as an employee, it's a friendly reminder of how far I've come and how much more I've learned about art since I first set foot in this gallery. Cool. All right, to end, um, everybody pull out uh, your checkbook or your credit card and uh, feel free to bid. <laughs> That's for whatever you think it's worth. This is fun to watch. Wonderful Who's on Me by Brancusch showing here on the right a very rare piece indeed. Starting this at $18 million, $19 million. $20 million with Annika Guntram, $22 million now. $24 million, thank you, Annika. At $24 million. At $24 million. She's right there. 25. It's by Giovanna, <laughs> 25 million. Giovanna's bid at 25 now. 33 million. 33 million dollars. 34 million, there's a new bidder. $34 million in the center there, $35 million, $34 million, $500,000, $35 million, $35 is here against both ladies now, $35 million. $39,500, 40000000 $40 million ahead of you, Eleanor. $40 million now. $40 million is here. $40 million, $500,000. And you better. $40 million, $500,000 with Maria Loss. $44 million, $500,000. Back to the aisle. Forty-four million five hundred thousand. Forty-nine million dollars. Still in the center there at forty-nine million. Not yours, Maria. Not yours, Eleanor. Do we hear the big number? <laughs> Fifty million dollars. Fifty million. 50 million and 500,000. Who would have thought? 50 million, 500,000. 51 million. 51 million dollars. Really? 51 million dollars. In the center here at 51 million. Not yours here on the phone, not yours, madam, on the aisle. The bid is here at $51 million. And selling at $51 million. Thank you, sir. $51 million. Amazing. $51 million. Holy, holy cow. Oh, my goodness.